Hello and welcome to Elven Home and to this the 100th episode uh, of the build of my N-Gage model layout, uh, Elven Home. Uh, get straight into the, the uh, video today because it's a bit longer in honour of the 100th partly. Uh, and I start, try to answer a question that was posed to me in the comments to my last video. This next section is for uh, Henrik in Sweden, whose um, name on the comments is Henrik Sweden 1. Based on the goods yard, how, do, how does a train, <clears throat> or a locomotive rather, that brings a goods train up into the goods yard, how is it released? Uh, and I said, explained to him that there's a shunter permanently stationed, and you can see the shunter um, just at the front of the goods shed. If I let's just take it forward a bit, see if it will play ball. There we go. So the shunter lives up at uh, High Elven, and it is in its uh, little uh, shed, which is where it lives. Let's see if I can get it to go into the little shed. Uh, now, if this works, I should be astonished because for it to work on screen is almost unknown. Now, ideally, it should run back into its shed. There we go. Um, so, how does the uh, a goods train coming up leave its load, pick up its new load and depart? And that little shunter is the key to the whole process. So I filmed a section showing how the process works. Now, whether this is prototypical is another thing, but I hope it is. Um, it was filmed holding it freehand. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have done that, uh, but having completed it and looked back at all the imagery, it's such a complicated set of moves. Um, it will do to show you how it works. So this is how the goods yard works. Here we see the train pulled by a J39 locomotive as it moves onto the branch line and starts the climb, entering its own portal just inside the tunnel. It emerges at Grey Havens and continues up the hill towards Sharky's End station, which is a request station. As it reaches the crest of the hill, it starts to decelerate getting ready to enter the goods yard at High Elven. It goes into the empty road which is waiting for it. The shunter is now able to come out, wait for the points to change and then back down onto the goods train, connecting at the brake van end. The train is unconnected from the J39 and is pulled away, clear of the points so that they can change, and it's then propelled down into the goods yard and the goods shed. This frees the J39 which backs out onto the main line to await the preparation of its train to take back down the hill. The brake van is separated from the incoming train and back down into the reception road. The shunter then moves out, waiting before it backs down onto the vans that are to go down taking eggs and also somebody's belongings as they're being removed uh, by British Rail. The train is then back down onto the brake van and this will make up the train for the J39 to take back down the hill. It's work done, the shunter moves forward and then reverses back into the goods yard to clear the road. At this point the J39 can come back, smoke box first in this way connect up to its train and will then make the journey back tender first.
and at this point it leaves the branch line returning onto the main line to remove these goods to the various other places to which they're destined. And that is how my goods yard was designed to work. In the last video I said that I would um, share with you the thought, my emerging thoughts about how about the design of the shed and how I'm going to build the new engine shed. This is going to replace the two Metcalf engine sheds that currently are the main ones at Weathertop Depot and they'll be replaced by a more recta rectangular structure. Um, this is the plan. It's likely it may change in both length and width slightly um, but we're talking millimeters rather than centimeters because as I'm starting to acquire the materials that I'm going to be using um, I'm now dealing with known widths of things uh, and to fit them in as I want them to be I may have to make it slightly wider and possibly a little longer but we'll we'll wait and see on the length. If you look at this plan you can see there are two uh, heavy lines. Those are the center roof line for the two canopies. The front of the um, shed is going to be just a straight, uh, like many other many sheds that I've seen, is just an open uh, sort of rect rectangle, uh, very flat front, and then the canopies will rise up probably in about four or five millimeter, um, or maybe a, a centimeter. Uh, will rise up behind running back to the back wall um, and that will be the roof line. The fine lines you can see is where the inner girders are meant to be uh, and that's where saying it'll be a bit wider um, that's a very fine line. This is a much thicker girder and so to have the five millimeter gap between them which I want this has got they've got to move out slightly. Um, but that's the value of, of acquiring these things before I start designing so that I'm designing using known materials and can build in the widths as I, as I get around when I finally get around to doing the drawings. Um, you can see here, which you've seen the materials before, I've mocked up one of what one of the canopies will look like, which if I bring it in line, you can see that this a little bit uh, perhaps, uh, the canopy actually finishes here. So that's the entrance that's going to be there. I'm not going to have any doors on the front. Um, no, not many sheds did have doors. Older ones did. But when you start looking at some of the bigger sheds that were taking more locomotives, there really wasn't time to open and shut doors. And anyway, if you've got locomotives inside that are, that are giving off a bit of smoke, the last thing you need is a, a, a shut door. Uh, this is being held together by Bluetech and some uh, uh, clamps which I got following seeing um, Chris's uh, channel, Bogner Regis, Chris's Engage, which I've mentioned before, where he'd acquired these from Smart Models. Uh, so thanks for the tip, Chris. And these are brilliant. Um, I do have some clamps 
uh, which you may have seen. I can't remember who made these ones now for the life of me. They're not pros, but but they're they're beasts. Um, you know, you could lift a sack of potatoes up with these things. And I mean a 28 pound bag of potatoes. Uh, the magnets on them are really fierce. And more than often, more than once when I've been doing a building and wanting to use those, the force with which those jaws go, <laughs> go together has caused the uh, card un or plastic underneath to deform um, <laughs> because of the force being exerted on it. So these um, still have really good um, uh, magnetic hold, but they're just not as fierce as, those, as the other ones. Uh, so I may well get some more of the T-clamps as well because the, the right angle ones, they're fine. But as you can see here, I'm wanting to hold things midway through. The T-clamps are working there because this one is set in a bit from the end, uh, as indeed will this one be a little way um, once I can uh, get the T-clamps to it rather than the right angle ones. So that's how the roof's going to be. And the thing that has been exercising my mind more than anything else is how I construct the walls. The Metcalf kits, uh, particularly the newer uh, Metcalf kits, if you remember from seeing me build the uh, Metcalf engine shed, which I turned into high elven train shed, they do have um, card formers which give the depth to the wall, but on each side there are printed paper which provide an external and an internal wall. And I'd been cudgeling my mind how I wanted to do that. Did I want to try to cut one long piece of card or did I want to try something different? And I've concluded, I think, that I want to try something different. And what you can see here, if I pick it up carefully, is the first prototype. And it is a prototype because I don't think it's entirely straight and I don't think <laughs> Uh, it's entirely the right width, but it's given me the opportunity to see how it build, how to build it. And I'll just adjust things a little bit so I can get a bit closer to the desk. And I'll show you how it is that I've created this panel. So here you can see one of the panels that I intend uh, to create to make the wall along the, the long edge of the engine shed. Um, I've approached it this way because I think this gives me the best chance of producing something that doesn't just look like a aping of a Metcalf kit. Um, it's made up by a combination, must be careful not to blind you, of uh, strip styrene of different kinds and I think it's Slater's brick card. I think this is actually a double O gauge uh, brick card. It's the same as I used for the fire station. Um, but I think it works okay as a, a kind of larger brick for the shed. Um, sometimes in N-gauge if you use the prototypical size bricks it just they just look too small. 
it's a it's an odd thing to say but they do um, so at the moment it's held together by tape because none of this is uh, well some of it's stuck together but not the the side parts what I'm proposing to do if I remove turn it over and remove this and try not there we go is to create an internal frame which slots into the H bar now this is I'm trying to remember which H bar this is this is uh, the four millimeter height H bar and the height obviously is the distance from the external of one uh, cross beam to the external of another now I'm using H beam and not I beam uh, this is something else I've learned because I beam uh, has flanges which means that the depth at the center by the bar is slightly narrower than the depth at the outer edge um, and I didn't want that effect and in any way as I understand in construction terms H beam is stronger I think uh, but what this will do then is the the it will hold this frame which I've created out of strip styrene uh, the eye the beam is going to be longer than the frame because I'm going to cut into the top of the eye beam to enable the girder to sit in on top of the wall so along the outer walls the girders will be if we're thinking if this was a real building so that those will be load bearing walls and helping to take the load of the roof I think um, the frame has been constructed by using uh, different thicknesses of strip styrene and if I take the windows out you'll see that there are two I'm using two of the brass windows with a piece of uh, clear perspex inside or film inside rather handily the three of those things together is as near as damn it one millimeter depth um, which is very useful for that to be the case the frame uh, is constructed from uh, one two three four five six seven eight pieces of yes I think it's eight pieces of varying thicknesses of strip styrene for the two major crossbars it's four millimeter by one millimeter strip styrene and then I uh, glue in two long pieces of strip styrene which is this stuff this is two millimeter by one millimeter strip styrene and that then gives me uh, the basic frame and then flush with the outer edge of the two millimeter pieces I glue in uh, two strips of one millimeter square strip styrene so that's starting to give me the frame into which the window is going to sit and then at the top and bottom oh sorry then I put a two millimeter piece in and that's set in obviously to get the right depth and then a one millimeter piece at the top and a one millimeter piece goes in at the bottom so that this gives a one millimeter edge all the way around the frame and that hole if I've got it right uh, is just right to take one of these frames these are PD model frames they're they're absolutely the right size if you wanted to use them for Metcalf kits but that sits in that then clips into there the plastic will go in inside and then another one reversed goes on top to give me my windows uh, now making this prototype and it is a prototype because as I said it's not it's not perfect by any means um, it was really just to see if I could I could do it accurately enough to get the window sitting in but in making the prototype um, it's helped me think about which side the um, brick is going to go with you know which side will be facing in and which side will be facing out it's much better to have this side where there's some depth uh, to put the, the card on because that gives as you can see here um, some nice depth and I've got to just work out that's better that gives some nice depth to the uh, a, a kind of lintel I probably I might put a lintel at the bottom there I think I probably will um, not lintel uh, 
right, recovering from the brain freeze, not a lintel, the sill, hurrah. Um, the lintel, I'm going to have a look. I've got some brass lintels that I got from uh, PD Models, but they're N-gauge ones and they may just look too small. Um, whether o -gauge one, double O-gauge ones to fit the brick would look good, I don't know. So I may have a look to see if I can find some straight lintels that can go across the top, as like a, a, a brick course there. Um, but that's where I am at the moment in terms of doing the window. Um, so the thing is, if I want to go down this route, I think I'm going to have seven windows each side. So I'm going to need to be able to make up 14 of these and to be able to cut accurately. Uh, and it's been useful and measure accurately and get these fitted in accurately. One of the things I think I'm going to have to do is make some kind of jig because um, even doing these ones, I've had problems in, in getting the uh, measuring everything and having it accurate. Um, and what I can't afford is for the panels to be different widths. Uh, if I do build them that way, the panels will be 40 millimetres wide. So that's been a rather long discussion because there's quite a lot to think about. Uh, let's leave that where it is and maybe go and take a look at a retrospective of the layout as it was originally intended and what I've actually ended up building so far. As this is the 100th episode, I thought I would take just about five minutes just to talk a bit about what I originally set out to do and what I've actually done. Now up on the screen now will come the uh, plan that I had at, by, at episode one and which indeed I printed out in full size and used as the template to help me with laying all the track. This plan is plan number four using code 55 track but I'd already produced 15 versions of a plan um, using Code 80 track. And I then decided that having read everything, Code 55 was more realistic uh, than Code 80. And that's what I wanted to go for. And you'll see that the plan in broad terms, if I do a quick sweep and you look at the plan, because uh, I'll put the plan in picture now if I learn how to do it. <laughs> um, the broad sweep, the basic layout of the track is as I originally intended. Uh, in particular, the, the depot is exactly as I intended. Well, it's not actually. There's an addition of the line at the back that goes up to the coal stage. But all those sidings were there and it was just a case of putting in an additional point. The, one of the key build requirements was for a platform which was capable of taking a tender engine, tender Pacific, and eight carriages. Because uh, I wanted to be able to run decent length trains and that determined the length of Weathertop. It also had to have a bay platform because there was going to be a branch line that wended, went, wended its way round up and over uh, to uh, a village perched above. And that is the village of High Elven, which is always intended to be there, 
But High Elven has changed from a chocolate box village with a church and a, and a green and possibly a duck pond uh, into a more, um, well, industrial is not, not the right word, but a working area in that it now has a goods yard. Uh, its housing is much more for working people, either agricultural workers uh, or people engaged in and around the station. Uh, and it's acquired uh, its own signal box, which it wasn't going to have before, which is based on Paul Chapman's uh, designs from Galgorm Hall. The viaduct turned into a bowstring bridge because I saw the scale model scenery bowstring bridge and I liked that better than the ratio viaduct, which as a kit I thought was the work of the devil. But the, this area here has changed markedly in that it was originally intended to all be the same height as Weathertop pretty much uh, and be an industrial area with a brewery. Uh, there was going to be a river coming down under the, the what was then the viaduct into a basin which was a port area. And there was even thoughts of, of the siding that goes up to the port would be a means by which uh, goods were ferried onto boats waiting in the port. Over time, I just didn't like the idea of the port more and more. It turned into a disused canal um, and then I promptly filled it in and did something entirely different. And certainly the idea of a gas works wasn't even being contemplated at that time. And so the whole area at that end has changed. As I was building, I decided I wanted to uh, have a war memorial. And so those gardens and the war memorial um, uh, came into being. And I began to enjoy scratch building, which is why you can see the hotel in green stood there. Wonderful Art Deco Hotel, which really upset the uh, locals when it was first built, together with the fire station, um, which was built, as you'll recall, because the uh, original hotel burnt down and the fire station was too far away to do anything about it. Um, so that whole area was not on the plan. Um, the track is right, but what is in there is completely different. And I like that area. The biggest change, I think, came at the other end of the layout. Um, the branch line, once High Elven had got a goods yard, the branch line as a single line just didn't work. So I had to retrofit uh, a dual line up there, which meant using surface uh, motors, because by that time I'd built everything and glued everything in, and there was no way I was going to be able to get motors that would be under the track. Uh, it would have meant tearing out too much. But Grey Havens was not in my original plans at all. All the line was supposed to do there, it would have been quite scenically pretty. Um, the two main lines swinging back round to, to run down the back. The branch line climbing as it does uh, up a kind of rocky incline to emerge. And, there, and the station that is there for Grey Havens wasn't even uh, there originally. It was going to be uh, in a different part of the layout completely. Grey Havens became to me whilst we were away on a long holiday just after I'd retired uh, and I was thinking about how I was going to do the scenic work on the incline um, and it just occurred to me to enclose the whole area and move the church because by then I'd begun to realise that High Oven wasn't going to be chocolate poxy, move the church across to here. Uh, High Oven taught me something quite remarkable. I enjoy gardening in Engage. I do not enjoy gardening in the slightest in full size, partly because I suffer from hay fever, but also because a bit like Dr. Johnson's description of golf, I consider it a good walk ruined. Uh, but give me an engage garden to design and build and I'm there. And I had great fun building that. And you can see there are videos in a playlist on the channel if you want to see how the whole of that area uh, came into being. Building the layout has been just the most amazing, great fun. And for the future, this area is where all my time is going to be spent because the work to be done now is completing the scenic work of building the depot, completing the um, covering of the, the floor in and around where I've finished doing the ballasting so far, uh, building the gatehouse or the gates that enter into the depot and completing the um, pathways and things completing the, ga the gas works, which is going to be more scenic work, which I'm going to start on probably in the next week. So that should probably be in the next video. And then uh, once I've worked out precisely how I'm going to do it, then closing this top area um, because the roads in and out of Weathertop uh, go through a tunnel at this end of the layout here, 
there will be a tunnel entrance there and this will all be covered in by the rocks coming down to the to the edge uh, and then building the remainder of high elven so i think i've got a good year maybe two years work before i'll have completed all the scenic works that need to be done on this layout and who knows what may change in that time what happens after two years we shall have to wait and see um, this has gone on a bit longer than I originally intended, but I thought it was just interesting to just take a look at what I set out to do 100 videos ago and what I've actually done. So I think that pretty much actually uh, brings us to the end of this edition of Elven Home. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, it's been great fun doing the 100 uh, videos. I do enjoy doing them. They really do give me impetus to think about uh, doing things. I've also benefited greatly from all the comments that I've had over time. Um, the hotel, for example, uh, started out as a little Victorian thing. Um, Paul Chapman suggested maybe Art Deco. Uh, and the help that I've had from people like David Auger, who actually I think went to Didcot to have a look at how things were laid out by the um, coal stage, which was extremely helpful. Uh, Chris Inch, who's, who gave me the uh, ash pit. And that's just a few, and there's loads of you that have given me comments that are all incredibly helpful. So if you do have any comments, please let me have them. If you've enjoyed the video, well, give it a thumbs up. That would be very helpful. I'm very grateful for that. And if you haven't subscribed already, well, do please subscribe and see how the layout will continue to develop as I start doing the scenic works in and around the top end of the layout. But until I speak to you again in a fortnight's time, uh, that's bye-bye from me. Bye-bye.